My parents met as teenagers. They're both working really hard to emancipate from their families of origin. They're working really hard to emancipate from those families for two very different reasons. They found each other probably in the backseat of a Chevy. And at 16 years old, they got pregnant with my brother. They promptly dropped out of high school, got married, moved in together, and took the kind of low-paying jobs that high school dropouts get to take. Ten months after my brother was born, I was born. Ten months after my brother was born. The joke in my family growing up was that after my brother came out, my dad went right back in. <laughs> On the eve of my fourth birthday, my parents separated and divorced. All four of my grandparents are Ashkenazi Jews, making, obviously, my parents Ashkenazi Jews, making me 96.2% uh, Ashkenazi Jew. I did one of those DNA tests you can find on Facebook. <laughs> Both my parents remarried by the time I was seven. My father, he remarried another Ashkenazi Jew. My mother, she remarried an Irish Catholic man. This was problematic for both of them for a couple different reasons. It was a problem for my mother because she married a guy who wasn't Jewish. Now, you got to remember, this is the 1960s, the early 1960s. Um, nobody broke that chain back then. You didn't marry out of your race or out of your religion, especially if you were an Ashkenazi Jew. There aren't that many of us. It was a problem for my stepfather because he was a Catholic man and he was marrying a woman who was divorced. They moved us to a very white, working-class neighborhood in Northeast Philadelphia. That's where I got my first taste of prejudice. Kids in the neighborhood made fun of me for the shape and the size of my nose. They teased me for being short. They teased me for having big ears. I remember one time the kids came home from Catholic school and they formed a circle around me in their uniforms and said, let's beat up the Jew. They they called me a rich Jew and they called me a dirty Jew, and I was confused by all this. Sometimes they, they called me a kike. I didn't know that word. I thought they were calling me a kite. I didn't know whether they were calling me a kite. I didn't feel like a kite. <laughs> the rich Jew thing was really confusing. You know, these rich Jews, I don't know where they are. They're not in my family. All my parents are high school dropouts. I keep looking for these rich Jews. I hope they show up sometime. I want them to send me their money. I'll do good things with their money. Um, but there were no rich Jews in my family, and the dirty Jew thing was also confusing to me. I mean, after I was a seven-year-old boy growing up in a city, I was probably pretty dirty. But my, my family was not, and my house was not. In my house, you didn't, you didn't have trash in trash cans in my house. Because if somebody came over to your house and they saw trash in the trash can, they might think you were dirty. So my house never had trash in the trash cans. In my house, if you were watching a TV show and you had a drink and you got up to leave for any reason... Anyone in your family, anyone in the family might have picked up that glass and taken it and washed it and put it away. My house was not dirty. We were not dirty Jews. My stepfather and mother then moved us to an even more segregated neighborhood outside of Philadelphia called Levittown, Pennsylvania. And Levittown was deliberately segregated. In Levittown, they, um, Levitt was a bigot, and he made a neighborhood that was just for the black folks. And it was called Bloomsdale, and that's where the black folks lived. And the black folks didn't go where the white folks lived, and the white folks didn't go where the black folks lived. That's just how it was. Busing was a big thing when I was a kid, and so um, it was the early 1970s, and so people started getting bused to achieve racial integration. And so I was bused past one school that was five minutes from my house to another school that was a half hour from my house to achieve racial integration. My black friends often remind me that the only time we ever started talking about busing is when white people started to get bused. I think this is true with a lot of things in this country. We don't start talking about this stuff until it happens to white people. When I was a senior in high school, I had an opportunity to take black history or American history. It was interesting to me that they gave us an option of these two things as if they were different. Three of my white friends and I, we took black history. And I again felt like other in that classroom as one of the few white kids in a class of all black people. But I felt welcome there. I felt at home. I felt accepted. I felt nurtured. I felt loved. You see, I grew up in a house where language was big. Words were big. I grew up in a house where um, curse words weren't the regular curse words. George Carlin used to say that there are seven words you, you shouldn't say on television. 
Um, curse words in my house weren't words like the F word. I grew up in a house where the F word was used all the time. I, I thought the F word had to be used in every sentence. I didn't know. I mean, I, I, I love looking out and seeing college students because you all have, you say the F word walking across campus, it's in all your songs. I feel like I'm at home when I'm with you. No, in, in my house, curse words were words like the N word. You couldn't say the N word in my house. You couldn't say the B word or the C word for women. There were curse words for every group. The Italians had curse words. We couldn't say those words. You couldn't say the words that we say for gays, lesbians, and bisexuals that you still hear used. You couldn't say those words in my house. You'd be in trouble. There are curse words for people with disabilities that still get used regularly. We use the R word like it's nothing. We still call people with disabilities invalids. Listen to the word. We're calling people invalid. These words were powerful and in my house, and I grew up learning that these are not words you use. Those other ones, be careful where you use them, but you can use them here. <laughs> I also learned that a bigot is a bigot is a bigot, and so that if you hear somebody saying the N-word when there's no black folks around, or the B-word or the C-word when there's no women around, you can bet damn sure, Mark, that they're saying dirty Jew when you're not around. You can bet damn sure they're calling cake when you're not around, because a bigot is a bigot is a bigot. And so I grew up about prejudice in a very different way than most people. When I got to college, I, I wanted to study this thing about prejudice because it confused the hell out of me. It really did. It confused me. I didn't understand it. I passed for white, so I would hear prejudice all the time. So I read this book. It was written in 1954 by a guy named Gordon Allport when I first got to college. And he, he talks about a couple different things in this book, but, but three that I'll highlight here. He talks about the idea that prejudice is normal. It's natural. It's it's to be accepted. We're going to have prejudice and we're going to have stereotypes because we can't meet every one of any certain group. So you're going to have stereotypes and prejudice based on certain things. Hell, if I'm the first Jew you ever saw, you might think this is what Jews are like. And you know what? We're kind of like this. <laughs> this is how we look. He says that many stereotypes are based in kernels of truth. They don't come from nowhere. They come from somewhere. And he says, not only is prejudice between groups, but prejudice is also within certain groups. Groups also have prejudice within them, not just between them. Now, I know about this because as a Jew, when people would ask me if I was Jewish, I would apologize and I would say, um, well, yes, almost as, as if I felt bad about it, which I did. I'd say, yes, I, I am, but, but my stepfather is Catholic. And, and it wasn't until much later in my life that I realized that being Catholic was just as bad as being Jewish. I, I, I didn't know. As a little kid, I wouldn't let you look at me from the side. When I was in school, I would want to sit in a way that you would never see me from my profile. I was embarrassed and ashamed and scared that you would see how Jewish I was. When I got to graduate school, I studied this guy named Carl Rogers, and Carl Rogers says that the distance between who you are and who you dream yourself to be, the greater the gap those two things are, the more psychologically impaired you probably are. So I started to apply this to prejudice, and I thought, well, I can't apply this to me because I'm not prejudiced. I grew up in a house where you couldn't say the N-word. I grew up in a house that didn't have prejudice. I learned from my mother that a bigot is a bigot is a bigot. And then I realized, oh, no, Mark. Until you can look at your own prejudice, until you can look at the fact that you have prejudice, and you can start to examine that like an alcoholic or an addict has a problem with addiction before they can do anything about it, I have to realize that I am prejudiced. And so I'm going to stand here, and I'm going to say something to you. It might sound a little crazy. I am a racist, sexist, ageist, classist, homophobic, heterosexist, able-bodiest, and lookist person. And with all due respect, so are you. So are you. And until you can admit it, until we can admit it as a society, we will not move anywhere because in our culture what we do is we keep trying to convince each other how cool we are. We say stupid things like, I don't see color, or we're all one race, or that all lives matter. It's crazy talk. I can't stand here and pretend I don't see your age. I can't pretend I don't see that your skin is black and mine is white. I can't pretend that. I can't pretend that I don't notice some of your eyes are shaped differently than mine. I can't pretend that I don't see your hair is sometimes purple. I can't pretend that I don't see these things. And I can't pretend that it doesn't impact our relationship because it does. And until we can come to grips with recognizing that the way we see each other just based on very limited information impacts who we are and how we relate to, relate to each other, we will do nothing about this problem, so we've got to stop pretending that we don't have prejudice. It's absurd. So I started to do some research to find out who's done work on this prejudice thing, and I was surprised as heck to find out that the group that did some of the earliest research on prejudice was the U.S. military. Because in the, in, before World War II, the U.S. military had separate barracks. They had enlisted men showers, 
that were for white folks and enlisted men's showers that were for colored folks. And they had barracks that were separate and showers that were separate. And so what they did is they, they did sensitivity training to try and reduce prejudice. So they put these people in a room and they did this sensitivity training, something like what I'm talking to you about right now, sort of. And what they found out is that prejudice did not go down. It didn't go down. All the sensitivity training in the world didn't decrease prejudice. So finally they said, the hell with this. You know what? Let's just move these dudes in with each other. Let's just move them all in together. Guess what happened to prejudice? It went down. It went down dramatically. And then researchers have to say, well, what the heck happened here? How did prejudice go down? What did we do? And so they found that when they met four specific conditions, when people share intimate beliefs in an atmosphere of cooperation and they are of equal status, sanctioned by some authority, when we do those things, prejudice almost always goes down. It almost always goes down. So how do we keep prejudice in our head? How does it stay in our head? What happens to us? So I'm driving on a very nice day from Los Angeles to San Diego with my two favorite bigots, my, my biological father and my stepmother. <laughs> you know, they're the kind of bigots that are bigoted in a way that they don't, um, they don't, they pretend they're not bigoted, but they are. They use all those words when no one's around, but they tell you how cool they are when they are around. And so on this day, we're driving from Los Angeles to San Diego. And as we're driving down there, and there's a car driving erratically, sure enough, my stepmother leans over to my father when she sees this car driving erratically, and she says, I knew it. And I lean forward, and I say, what is it that you knew? And she said, never mind. I'm probably not supposed to say this to you. And I said, my guess is you're probably not supposed to say this to anyone. <laughs> but tell me anyhow. So she told me. She said, okay, I'll tell you. I knew it would be an oriental driver. Now, my first thought was oriental refers to food and rugs, not people. But I don't correct her just yet. I am capable of that. She says, you wouldn't know. You live in Colorado. There are no Orientals in Colorado. You wouldn't know. So I say, let's do a survey. We got two hours to sit in the car. I'd rather do this than talk to you. Let's do a survey. <laughs> From Los Angeles to San Diego on this given day, let's see how many Asian folks or Pacific Islanders are bad drivers. And we find out on this given day, Asian and Pacific Islanders do not have a monopoly on driving poorly. We know who the worst drivers are in this country. We know who they are. They're 16 to 17 year old boys. So how does my stepmother hold in her head that Asian and Pacific Islanders are the worst drivers? She holds in her head the same way I hold it in my head and the same way you hold it in your head. She has a file, a file in her head that says bad Asian driver. So when she sees a bad driver that's not Asian, no file. When she sees a bad driver that is Asian, boom, she files it. So what's in your file? What's in your file? I have a file. I have a file for black folks. I have a file for brown folks. I have a file for Republicans. I have a file for people from Nebraska. Okay, I have, <laughs> I have a file, and so do you. And you need to look at your file. So I started to examine, like, has anybody in current events done anything that's reduced prejudice or shown that prejudice can be reduced by meeting those four conditions? And sure enough, I get online, and I find this guy named Daryl Davis. And Daryl Davis is an African-American musician who plays in a white band, and he ends up playing at Ku Klux Klan rallies. And he stands around, and he talks to people, and they share intimate beliefs in an atmosphere of cooperation. And they're of equal status, and prejudice goes down. And Daryl Davis gave me permission to use his photographs, and you can read about them online if you'd like. Daryl Davis walks, goes to these places and talks to these folks. Ann Wilson Schaaf wrote a book called Women's Reality. And in her book, she says that prejudice is like air pollution. When you're in air that stinks really, really bad for a really long time, you stop smelling the stink of the air. It's just the way the air smells. And so the air, as a white male, heterosexual, temporarily able-bodied man, is almost always mine. And so when my black friends tell me that a place feels racist, when my women friends say it doesn't feel safe to walk through the parking garage or their workplace feels like there's a creeper working there, I go like this, I don't smell that because it's not my air. And so my job is to smell the air when it stinks, especially when it doesn't stink for me. White people, I'm talking to you. White, male, heterosexual, temporarily able-bodied folks, I'm talking to you. Smell the air when it stinks, especially when it doesn't stink for you. So let's bring this to a close here, okay? I've been to the, some of the richest places on the planet and the poorest places on the planet. We all want the same stuff. We want a safe place to sleep at night. We want water to drink that's good for us. We want clean air to breathe. We want our other kids of the world to have a chance at a life. We might want health care. We might want an education. 
And what we want to do is we want to connect. So in the 60s, when I had a Volkswagen Beetle, we would ride by other Volkswagen Beetles and we would do this. Ask your parents, young folks. <laughs> and it felt good. I had a Harley Davidson for 25 years, and I don't know if I like driving the Harley as much as I like getting the wave from other Harley riders. I go to football games, and I'm a football fan, and I see people raise their hands, and I'm thinking, oh, crap, I don't want to do the freaking wave. And everybody starts doing the wave, and then I start doing the wave, and I look across the stadium, and I see that even the team I'm fighting against is doing the wave. You see, we want to connect. The desire to connect is great. Something's in the way of that. So maybe, if we smell the air when it stinks, when it doesn't stink for us, maybe if we can come to grips with looking at what's in our file, maybe if we can start to look at the words we use and how powerful they are, maybe then, maybe then, the divide that you see in the United States and in the world right now, maybe then we'll actually find out that we can all come together and, and fix this stuff that's going on right now. Thanks. <laughs>